Andy Mitten, good morning to you. How are you? I'm in a rainy Istanbul and I'm not as uh, as excitable as I was when I spoke to you one week ago after Manchester United. Beat. These midweek conversations have become a staple of you celebrating life and, uh, you know, uh, Uncle Travelling Matt style postcards back from the rest of Europe while we're all stuck uh, in lockdown. And today it's a little bit grim for you. Yeah, well, I mean, Istanbul's a wonderful city, but I think I've, uh, I've come here. The day that the sun stopped and it's just been raining for a few days, so I'd hoped for a better performance from Manchester United last night, but sadly that wasn't forthcoming either. So we have the situation today where the team have lost uh, the last two matches. Uh, a mood of gloom prevails among Manchester United fans right now. You were down talking with um, the um, manager last night. I've seen you talk about that on Twitter. Did you talk to any of the other players in the mix zone? Did they come out and speak afterwards? Sorry, you have to say that again. Yeah, no worries. The, the um, famous Istanbul coffee houses. Uh, were you did, in the mix zone? Did you talk to any of the Manchester United players? And, and what was the what were they actually saying after that defeat last night? Well, th there wasn't a mix zone because there hasn't been during COVID times. Um, I, I did um, go into the press conference, and I think was the only journalist in in there um, from the UK because I'm going back to Spain where I don't have to quarantine. Those other journalists were not able to come here because they have to go back to the UK into, into the lockdown. Um, I asked Ollie Gunner about the goal, and he just simply don't expect to see goals like that at that level of football. I might have added, you don't expect to see goals like that at any level of football, but it was clearly very poor. I also spoke to the Turkish coach after the game, and he was delighted not just with the performance, but with getting Edison Cavani's shirt for his son as well. So there was a real yeah. feeling that the name of Manchester United um, is a giant of world football, which it is. It's one of the three biggest teams in the world. And for a team like Istanbul Besiktas, who are playing in the Champions League for the first time, that was the first ever win. They celebrated wildly. And when I say they, I mean the players. And there were actually a few hundred fans allowed in the stadium last night, including about 40 ultra-style fans who sang throughout the game. And I think their support made a little bit of a difference, but the biggest um, aid to, to their team was Manchester United's farcical defending for that first goal. Andy, we're just having a little bit of trouble hearing you there on, on our side, so we'll come back to you in just a minute. Um, uh, the, the farcical defending, Owen, I think, is the type of thing that ultimately when you're making a case against a manager, if you're a board or whoever you are, you, you point to that kind of stuff and you say it's less, I mean, it's, it's a fig leaf, really. Um, but it's it's part of a dossier you're going to build up. And, and as you said earlier on, you need a scapegoat in moments like these. Like it, it can often be used as a term that is thrown around negatively, but I think it's, the truth in football is that you need somebody to blame because you need a quick fix sometimes. And if the coach isn't getting the best out of a defence, for example, which looks like it isn't the case, then a change of coaches is, is often the way to go about it. By the way, I, I didn't realise that uh, cappuccinos were such a big thing in, in Istanbul. That was the, the loudest frother I've ever heard in my entire life, just going non-stop. A lot of uh, coffee doing around there this morning. But, uh, like, I, I, I don't know. Like, what, what, what do you think about, about the, the, the soldier situation? What, what side of the fence are you coming down on? Is, well, is it possible to sit on the fence in this? I was definitely on the stick with Solskjaer, give him a year, let him see what happens. You know, the, uh, on the basis of the conversations with Andy last week, essentially, where... It's like, okay, change, 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 nothing happens. They've changed the manager, they've changed Moyes, they've changed Van Hal, they've changed Jose, and actually the situation has not improved significantly at any point or got worse. They've, they've, they've got so much money invested in the playing staff, the playing staff is actually quite good. And so they're always going to be at a level where they're capable of winning a trophy or reaching the top four or making a run in whatever European competition they're in. And that has kind of been the level that they've been stuck at. So you need something to to break that pattern and sticking with the manager and letting him inculcate his view and philosophy and, and getting a playing staff that he wants seems to me like the best way to do that. You are letting somebody like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer learn on the job and um, that's very, very difficult. That's like, you know, that's very high pressure. So uh, the only, the, the issue about moving and changing to Pochettino right now is that Pochettino is available and you like that guy is available I need to get that thing it's burning I have money to buy this thing and then I, I need this and then you get it home and you're like did I, did I need this did I 
I didn't really need this. There's an amazing story that um, uh, Louis C.K. tells on a podcast with Mark Maron about a trumpet where he really, 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 really wants the trumpet. <laughs> Spends all his money on it and then gets home and realizes, did not need this trumpet. I, yeah. I just needed, I needed something else in my life, but I did not need this trumpet. And uh, I have a feeling that Richard Pochettino is a bit of a trumpet at the moment for Manchester United fans because you know, Pochettino was a good manager, but is he, is he Jurgen Klopp? Did he, well, uh, did he win a league in, in a situation where the opposition is actually the evil empire who will steal your best player as soon as he gets good enough? No, he didn't. I mean, he's, he's been a good manager, but not a great manager just yet. And if you're Man United, uh, you need a great manager. You need a, an iconic, totemic figure who's going to come in and be like, this is my club. These are my, yeah. you know? I, I, I do think, though, that uh, the... Uh, how iconic Jurgen Klopp has been for Liverpool is way more iconic than he has been in his previous life. Of course, he was a massive figure in Borussia Dortmund. He's a huge, charismatic figure that we all knew about. But I definitely think he's gone to a whole new level in terms of his own reputation after going to Liverpool. The comparisons with Klopp and Solskjaer have actually been something that's come up this week because they it's been 100 games of Solskjaer and people have been doing comparisons between 100 games of Klopp and 100 games of Solskjaer. Uh, and in those first 100, 100 Premier League games, that is. So Solskjaer won 65 Premier League games in those first 100. Klopp won 69. So people are like, oh, uh, Solskjaer, not too far behind Jurgen Klopp. Let's not forget about Jurgen Klopp's slow start to life as Liverpool manager. But really, the comparisons are so pointless, given Manchester United have been preparing their squad to challenge for the Premier League, whereas the first 100 days that Klopp was just trying to steady the ship Somewhat. You look at the comparisons on transfer spending over that time. Klopp spent £121 million in, uh, across the windows in his first 100 games, whereas Solskjaer spent a quarter of a billion. £249.5 million is what he spent. You look at their 10 most used players over that period of time. Uh, like Nathaniel Klein, Emre Chan, uh, Adam Lallana were in their top four alongside Roberto Firmino. Whereas for United, it's Rashford, Lindelof, De Gea, Martial... Much better players, really. You go down the rest of the of the, the Klopp top ten. You've got Mignolet, Milner, Origi, Coutinho, Lovren, yeah. and Lucas. Like they're, they're not uh, similar situations whatsoever. No, they're, they're different. Enough. And the point was that he was actually cresting towards something. Um, Andy Minton is, is back with us. Andy, good morning to you again. We, we've been talking while you were away there about the the um, decision to to stick or twist with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and, and last week we felt like we'd kind of reached a point where it looked like that conversation had kind of abated for the foreseeable future and since then two fairly sterile defeats has reopened it and suddenly the weekend game seems huge again. Yeah it does and this is a trend of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's time at Manchester United um, with massive swings in results in the performances and in the mood as well so after that 5 0 defeat, again, a victory against Leipzig a week ago, United fans were singing his praises for his tactical acumen for beating the team who were top of the Bundesliga and beating them so convincingly. And then there's that 1 0 defeat at Old Trafford. Now, in isolation, that defeat against Arsenal, people would say, OK, but United have failed to win in any of the four home league games so far this season. They've not won at Old Trafford in seven matches now. And that, that's just nowhere near good enough for a team with the aspirations of Manchester United and the fans are baffled that the same team can go to Paris and play so well and yet are incapable of winning at home in the Premier League and all it adds up to is pressure building on the manager and if you had an approvals rating if you like they have slumped for him in the last week it's not the first time that this has happened but it can't keep on happening when it's happening after six months or a year fans are saying OK, he's still new to the job, he's got to make his own team, but as of next month, he will have been in the job for, for two years. And getting to third last season, I think, was an achievement, especially after the really poor start to the season. But it was crucial that he didn't have a poor start to this season. And he's had a very, very poor start to this season. Look at the league table, it doesn't lie. And there are always mitigating circumstances. The pre-season preparation was poor. It's still very early on in the season. But the results are just not good enough right now. The, the uh, trend, the, the little boom and bust that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has had is a micro trend of the macro trend, which is actually Manchester United since Alex Ferguson left. And, uh, you know, you made the case very well last week. I thought that 
essentially getting rid of Solskjaer again just restarts that whole thing and either you stand for something or you stand for nothing. And yet the last two performances have been so bad, you kind of feel like, oof, it's, it's, it gets harder to make that case. It does have been so, so bad. And I don't think that the Old Trafford crowd would have accepted what I saw at, uh, uh, on Sunday against Arsenal. I don't think they would have accepted that performance against Chelsea in, in the previous home game, and certainly not in the 6-1 uh, against uh, Spurs. The fans would have been roaring their team forward. It's far too pedestrian. The team looks lacking of ideas. And this boom and bust cannot go on. And as you say, it's a microcosm of United post Fergie. There's never been enough consistency for the team to challenge for the Premier League. They've not even come close to that. And don't think United fans felt this season the team would be winning the Premier League. But they did expect to see more of an, an improvement. And yeah, if United go and win the Champions League, fantastic. But it, it's there's there's no kidding here that there's clearly um, issues uh, within the, the team, within within the club, and the players. They do actually like Solskjaer. I mean, he's a very likable person. He's a good person, and I wouldn't write him off as being um, a clueless coach when clearly he's had results against some of the best coaches in the world. This is a team that beat Manchester City twice away last year beat Chelsea away twice, beat PSG away twice. But their inability to overcome teams who defend in numbers is worrying because when you're a top team like United or inferior top team, that's what teams are going to do. They're going to sit back and try and hit you on the counter. Ironically, United's best results have been coming when it's United who've been hitting teams on the counter with those fast attacking young strikers. Um, but in Istanbul last night, I mean, I spoke to him after, after the game. And you know, I, I'm probably in the minority now. I still want him to do well. I'd still like to see him turn him around, but he cannot just keep getting chance after chance after chance. At some point, someone will look at the league table and say, this is just not good enough. He knows that too. What was, what was his sense? Like, does he look like a man who feels like the axe is coming? Now listen, I've seen humans look better than what I saw him last night. The first thing is he looked at me because I think I was the only... Um, British journalist in there and he went, how have you got here? <laughs> and, and he actually smiled as he as he said it. And and then you know, I had to do my job and ask him questions. And the first thing I asked him about was that, that farcical uh, goal. He's under a lot of pressure and he's working very hard. I know recently his family went back to Norway and all of his players had a, a little few days off and he chose to stay at Old Trafford to, to work. And I don't think there's any... Uh, of, of the manipulation going on. I think towards the end of Jose Mourinho's time, he didn't want to be there and he was just waiting for that sack. I think Ole Gunnar genuinely wants to turn Manchester United around, but he's a football manager and managers are judged by their results. And when you manage one of the three biggest clubs in the world, those results are expected to be very good. I think the fans have been patient with him. He's been in the job for nearly two years now. Even now, I think at Old Trafford, fans would be singing... Um, his name. But one problem you have now is with no fans inside the ground, that's where the mood is usually set. You're just left with this online morass of, of anger and these exaggerated swings either way when the team wins or loses. And you're getting knee-jerk reactions even before matches um, when the team selection comes out as if they're waiting to be proved right this is disgraceful, disgraceful. OK, we just won 4-1 today. I'll be quiet until the next match. And it's not a healthy environment um, around Manchester United in terms of the media. I don't think that the players are checking their social media all the time. It's probably good that they're not doing that because of all the abuse. But there's abuse, and I'm, I'm not um, con con condoning that. There's abuse because there's frustration there. I mean, look, look at the league table. And... When I see Liverpool fans abusing their players um, because they don't win every match on social media, that's more of an issue for, for social media rather than the, the managers of the club themselves because Klopp's obviously done an exceptional job and he's got a fantastic team. But the whole mood around the club, especially with the mood in the world at the moment, is just re really negative. Should Manchester United fans be worried, Andy, if things continue to get worse under Solskjaer and the board actually don't act, that 
Manchester United as a football club will settle for a sixth or seventh position in the Premier League. Would that not be quite a worrying state of affairs? Yeah, I don't think they will settle for sixth or seventh because right. if you're looking at it really cynically, the the money is in the Champions League and the club is built to be playing Champions League football. So as a bare minimum, there's got to be a top four finish. But even that's not good enough. Finishing fourth every year is what Arsenal seem to to settle for. Um, in one way, I admire a board which sticks by the manager because had we been doing this in January 1990, 95% of United fans would have wanted Sir Alex Ferguson to be sacked. They would have said that he's had three years, um, the tide of his excuses, and, and he has to go because the team have been 11th and 13th in the table. And Martin Edwards, to his credit, he stuck by his manager and, and look what happened next. Do I sense that Oli Gunnar is going to be the next Ferguson in waiting once he's got time to build the team after this cultural reboot? I'm not convinced of that because I've not seen the, the evidence of that. I see uh, results individually. I know a lot's going on behind the scenes, which is positive at the club. I think the youth system is looking much brighter. A lot of investment has gone, gone into that. And United have got a clearer identity of bringing younger players in. Um, but it's all about results. And I don't think you get the patience now in 2020 that you would have got 30 years ago. I mean, people go absolutely crazy if they don't win every single match. And it's more patient inside Old Trafford. But if there's no fans in Old Trafford, where does that patience come from? I guess as well, uh, the impatience that comes from last night is hammered home by the defensive display for Demba Ba's goal. What was your take on that? And how does that happen to a professional football team, let alone Manchester United? My take was that I looked up and said to the person next to me, did that just really happen? And looked around to find a screen in the press box so that I could see it again and stared in disbelief at the screen and wondered why the entire Manchester United defence had decided to cross from the European to the Asian side of Istanbul during the match. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. What on earth have I just seen here? Now, I'm all for attacking fullbacks and Luke Shaw and Aaron Wambasaka getting forward. But, you know, you've got to stay on the pitch. <laughs> and Jemba Bar, he's 35 years old and he sprinted away to score the goal. I'm like, have I just really seen this? It was freakish. And the performance in the whole first half, wow, it was it was so, so bad. And and that's a worry. When United start games well, they tend to win. And when they don't, you can just see the confidence just dripping away and the inevitable coming. I felt like at Old Trafford on Sunday against Arsenal, where tactically Arteta did a job on on Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And the same thing happened in Istanbul. The Turkish champions, they don't have the financial power of a club like United, but they've done very well domestically. They're a very well-run club from a footballing perspective. And their coach impressed me with the way which he spoke um, after the game. They thought United were there for the taking. They felt that they deserved more from the first two Champions League matches. And that was always a worry ahead of last night. And it was defeat. In mitigation, it's the first defeat after 10 straight away wins. And, and this is another thing, 10 straight away wins. That's incredible. United have not lost away since Liverpool in January. But look at that home form. It's yin and yang all, all, month after month. Is there is there an obvious way to turn it around for Solskjaer? No, I don't think there is. The, the, the simple way is to start winning. That's the obvious way, but... That's what everyone in football says. And, and, and every team in football can't win. There has to be losers. There has to be teams who, who drop points. What I'd say is when there's been these slumps before, he has tended to pull out results. I can remember speaking to you last December uh, when he'd won four out of the first 14 league games and then beat Tottenham at home and Manchester City away and suddenly the mood picked right up again. And then United lost at Watford, who'd won one of the previous 17 matches. And nearly a year on from that, we're still in this boom and bust um, cycle. United have got the players as they've shown to be any team in the world. They go to Everton on Saturday. That's played at 12.30 local time. The club are not happy. They've not said it publicly, but they're not happy privately uh, that the, the game is so early. Coming after an away um, fixture in Istanbul, I think there's only 60 hours between the two games. 
I felt part of me last night that Ollie was thinking more about Saturday. And I think he does that quite a lot. He thinks about the next the next game, but sometimes you've got to get results in the actual game that, that you're playing. But yeah, if United were to lose at Everton and then lose again against West Brom at Old Trafford, the mood would really, really sink then. Could I say that he's going to lose his job? I can't because it's not my decision. Um, and I think that Ed Woodward, who would be in the decision in conjunction with the Glazers, he wouldn't be spared criticism either because he talked a year ago in an interview I did with him of a cultural reboot at Manchester United. And fans are like, OK, we're a bit circumspect listening to that, but let's see the evidence of that. And if you then change the main proponent of that, the manager, then that would cast more doubts on that. The One last question for you. The, the appearance on TV this week has made the Pochettino link red hot because that's how the again the news cycle works Pochettino comes out and says he wants a job a manager has a bad result and obviously he has long been linked with that job since um even while he was at Spurs because he had lunch with um Alex Ferguson um is, is Pochettino not just the available manager is he automatically the best manager out there he's the available manager and I wrote for him to be United manager in May 16 just before Jose Mourinho um, got the job and he didn't because obviously went to Mourinho who was the overwhelming favourite at the time and one which 85% of Manchester United fans welcomed um, Pochettino is the big out of work manager right now he did a very good job at Tottenham he's not won any trophies but I spoke recently to Morgan Schneidlin I went to see him in his new club Nice and he spoke of the transformation Pochettino made within days when he arrived at Southampton, even though he couldn't speak English at the time. And I spoke to someone who knows Pochettino. He divides his time between um, Barcelona and the UK, as I do. And he obviously wants to get back in. Uh, he's a good manager. I mean, I, I watched his Tottenham team in the final of the European Cup. Tottenham Hotspur are not a team I expected to be in the final of any European Cup. And OK, they've not been winning, but he's a good manager. But maybe I'm still in a minority. I'd still like to see Ole Gunnar Solskjaer turn it round because this cycle of just changing managers every two years, it hasn't worked. And I'd like to see if there is another way. But when you get results like we've seen in the last couple of days, my conviction in that argument is obviously weakened. Andy, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Thank you. Sandy Mitten there. Um, obviously, you can read his stuff in The Athletic, in ESPN, on 442 Magazine, and of course, the, uh, the fanzine, you know how we stand, the original and best.